Hello, hello, hello. Hi there and welcome back everyone to the next um, session of our Agile TD free webinar series. And we see that there are so many people in here already and we really encourage you to just, um, yeah, what you already do, say where you're from. It's always nice to see where you're tuning in from. And thanks so much for everyone who's here. It, and um, let's have a nice little hour together. Um, before we actually jump into the session with these two ladies here, um, just a few announcements uh, on our side. Uh, for those of you who don't know, we, the Agile Testing Days in November are going hybrid this year. This means that um, four tracks and four full days uh, will be available online. So you can take part from wherever you are. And uh, we hope that um, you will take this option and tune in and join us um, for this. Just, yeah, just to see that everybody is still there and to just share and see what's happening in the community and for you to get some insights. And um, for more information on that, please just go to the button down there in the middle and have a look. It would be great to see um, all of you there um, in November. So check that out. Also, I want to make sure that you know that there's the next course available from the Agile Testing Fellowship. Um, Janet and Lisa both are co-founders of that. And the next course will happen in July from the 27th to 30th, Agile Testing for the whole team. And my colleague Stephanie will post all those information and resources in the chat. So check that out and see if you want to take part. And the last announcement I want to make for our next Azure TD webinar, which is going to be held by Cam Perry. He is um, a speaker supposed to be at Azure Testing Days USA. This year will be next year, uh, full stack developer by heart and an agileist um, by heart as well. So he will be there July 15th with us and doing a webinar. You should definitely come and join and check out his podcast as well. I think it will be in the link will be in the chat. Um, wonderful podcast by him, the latest version especially. All right, so um, before we start, a quick run through this tool. Well, this is Crowdcast. Um, you've jumped the first hurdle by registering. <laughs> Other than that, there will be the chat, um, also still available after the webinar, so you can still network and communicate. You can use it to just say where you're from and share some information. For any questions, however, we would ask you to please go to the Ask a Question box in the middle of the screen and post your question or upvote for a question that's already been posted in there. Also, we have a poll running this time, so you can go into the poll right here somewhere and um, uh, give us some feeling and you know about the atmosphere and um, just put some answers there if you want as well. The crowdcast is being recorded so you can have a look at it right after the session has stopped and we will also put it up on our YouTube channel so you won't miss anything. And any open questions will be answered by Janet and Lisa after the webinar and we will put it in our blog post on the Agile Testing Days website. So um, that's to that. Also, thank you to Source Labs. They are our sponsors for this webinar, and they have so nice to still stick with us through these crazy times and are sponsoring our event for next year in the US. Thank you so much. And now to Janet and Lisa. Well, um, for those who don't know them, <laughs> um, besides what they do individually as Agile coaches and consultants, they are the co-founders of the Agile Testing Fellowship. Uh, like I said before, offering a lot of help. You can become a fellow as well. You can join their courses and uh, reach out to them as well for your individual help. Um, they've been great with mentoring. They are doing um, the Lean Coffee sessions for our conferences. Um, besides that, helping out the community since forever, they have been an essential part for our community and of our endless support. And we cannot thank them enough for everything they do for us and for the community. So, um, Janet and Lisa, thanks so much. And um, also, they have written many books. And the last one is <laughs> Agile Testing Condensed. So, get it, put it in your shelf, and also read it. Uh, there will be the link in the chat as well. So, um, Janet and Lisa, thanks so much. I will now pass the stage on to you 
and um, I hope you all enjoy it. And um, thanks so much again for being here. Thank you for those kind Thank words. <laughs> Very nice. All right. Let's see if I can figure out how to share again now. Yeah. Just go no. over your screen and then top right. Your screen. You got it? Where is it? And On the top right of your browser. Top right, it says share. Yeah. That one? Yeah, but it's giving me the share to Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn. Oh, no. oh wrong move share. Your mouse, move your mouse over your own picture. And uh, it will be a share screen button on the top. Oh, okay. Yes. All right. Thank you. There. Hooray. Hooray. It's always a, it's every, um, every new tool is, is just a wee bit different. So it's a matter of, of getting it to the right place. All right, so uh, today Lisa and I are talking about quality processes in an agile environment. I hope that's what you're here to um, hear about. Hopefully none of you think we're going to talk about TQM or ISO or any other quality model. Um, but we are going to talk about quality. So a little bit about us, though I think that uh, Ina gave a great um introduction. Um, I've been coaching and working with Agile teams since the early 2000s. I worked as, on teams as a tester, a coach, helping teams transition. Um, and for the last 10 years, I've been working as a consultant and trainer. Lisa, how about you? Oh, we both started in Agile about the same time, I think. Yeah. And um, currently, I'm working for Outsystems as a quality coach and helping to build an observability practice. And I have a terrible echo on myself, so I'm going to try refreshing my screen. Yeah. So carry on, right. Janet. Thank you. Okay. I will carry on. So that's all we're going to say about us, because um, Ina said everything else. Now, in 1982, Edward Deming identified 14 key principles for business effectiveness. Um, these principles, I believe, are alive and well and doing it very effectively in, in good agile teams and organizations. Two, these are two of my favorite quotes from Deming. Um, quality is everyone's responsibility and improve quality, you automatically improve productivity. Um, so you think about that a little bit. Uh, the next two quotes are mine, something you'll have heard me say if you've listened to any of my talks. If you focus on quality, the speed will come. If you focus on speed, the quality gets lost. And these are things that both Lisa and I really believe in, is the focus on quality needs to come first. Now, the message we want to get you to think about today is the relationship between product quality and process quality, how we develop our products. Right? Does one influence the other or are they symbiotic relationships? And so I think we need to think about um, how we, we develop our products because I think it also will influence how we see our quality in our product. Now, quality is vague. Um, there's so many different definitions of quality and um, Lots of people view it different ways. There's so many different perspectives. Um, and it's really hard to have that conversation or to describe what quality means. So I want to use coffee as, as an example. If you don't like coffee, think tea or beer or something, right? But I need you to look at these three pictures. Um, I want you to think about which one is the best for you. Which one do you think um, is the best? I know Lisa doesn't drink coffee, so she won't like any of these. Um, but uh, all right, did everybody pick one? Have you got one in your mind, which is best? Um, are you like me? I actually think number one is probably the best because I like plain black coffee. Or 
Are you one of those that, that like cappuccino? So you like lots of foam, number two. Or do you like number three with a pretty design? Right. Depending on your perspective, you might have chose different ones. So everybody's choosing number one, number three. So lots of people have different ideas, right? Now, what I want you to do is think about how did you make that choice? Did you think about the quality of the coffee at all? Maybe the beans, where it came from? How were those beans roasted? When were they picked? Um, did your was it, you know, out of a drip coffee maker or was it a cappuccino maker? Who made it? Did you think about the quality at all? What was the perspective that you made your choices? Just a, that's just a question to ponder a little bit. Um, in Agile today, we have different focuses. And I want you to think about what your focus is uh, when we build our product. Do you think about the people, the customer, um, maybe quality from the customer perspective means fitness of use or customer satisfaction. Maybe from the process perspective, it means how well did we build it? Did we adhere to our standards and specifications? Or maybe from the product perspective as a whole, uh, quality might mean the degree of excellence at an acceptable price, right? Many um, organizations adopt Agile because they think it'll go faster. It'll help them make go faster. But we really need to think about the balance, the desire for speed. So how well do we make it? Or the actual product quality, right? So we're, but today we're going to talk about um, not product quality so much as the process quality, because that's what this is about. The process and how we build it, we believe it makes a difference. Um, being working in an agile environment, hopefully it's open and collaborative. That's the idea. I think it works in our favor for better quality products, right? Things like the small focus teams, um, including quality and testing activities from the very beginning to the end. And we'll talk more about that today. Um, Things like making sure the development teams have direct access to the business, making them part of the team, right? These things all affect how we make our quality in our product. Okay, Lisa. All right. So I lost my place. <laughs> Seriously. Okay. So. Jana and I no longer use the term software testing because there's so much more to it now. Products are more than just the code, right? Um, it's all intertwined, the user experience and, and all kinds of quality attributes. So we like to use the term product testing. We're testing our product, we're testing features, we're testing ideas, we can test lots and lots of things. And also, we don't consider Agile testing a methodology. It's simply how we fit testing into Agile teams and organizations and how we build quality in. Um, so I'm being distracted because I have a terrible echo. Uh, <laughs> so in my and Janice experience, when everyone on the team talks about what kind of quality do they want to deliver to their customers and agree on that level and make a commitment, then they can collaborate to build quality into the product. They know they're going to run into problems, but if we're committed to it, we'll have the discipline to overcome that. And in my experience, that's how we make sure we do all the testing activities, we build quality in, and we become a high performing team. We're happy and our customers are happy. And this is our experience over the last couple decades, and I'm so happy now that we have science to back up what we've seen, things like the State of DevOps survey, the studies done at Google, and so on. We need teams whose members represent diverse backgrounds, experience, perspectives, and skills, right? There are lots of different skills needed on for our complex applications today. So we, we need specialists, but we need the specialists to share and transfer those skills. And that diversity 
helps us innovate and solve problems. And, and again, we have studies that show how important diversity is to innovation and success. So there's kind of a aphorism that's like, if everybody's responsible, then nobody's responsible. So if everyone owns quality, then who's really responsible for it? Um, so we've been lucky to work for companies who's at least some of some of the companies we work for, whose leaders understood that the focus on quality is the way that you get the, the best way to get business value to customers frequently at a sustainable pace. So if you focus on speed, things are going to go badly. But focusing on quality means you don't accumulate so much technical debt. You you learn how to build incrementally and in, iteratively. So your, your team and your company are more likely to succeed with continuous delivery and delighting your customers. So let's look at this DevOps cycle and where te testing fits in, right? We know we don't test quality into the code after we deliver the code. It's never, that's never impossible. We have to build it in. So that means we gather data from the customers as they're using our product. We, the business stakeholders, learn from that data, decide what features to build next. And then as a delivery team, we can talk to them and get their business rules, examples of how they want those features to behave. And then we make the commitment to build it right and deliver it to production, take care of it in production, keep learning. So that continuous loop, we're testing all around it. So, I'd like you, we'd like you to just take a minute and I'm going to time it on my phone and consider all the testing activities your team does. I know Janet and I made a list of this and came up with a whole lot. Uh, so make a mind map, make a list, whatever works for you and, and just take a minute to think about that. You can share them on the chat if you want to as well. Exactly. If I could. If I could work my phone, I could do this. Yes, that is a wonderful visual by Dan. I'm glad, I'm glad somebody noted that there. This is the actual, the absolute hardest part of doing a webinar, just being silent. Nobody's sharing, but I'm hoping they're writing them down. Yeah, especially if you have any unusual ones that you think maybe other people don't have to do, please share them. Okay, that's been about a minute. I hope you had time to write down some of them. Okay. So, somebody sending me the unemployed, but yeah, you're probably, if you're a tester, you're probably testing things all day anyway, just because that's what you do. So, yeah, integration testing from Linda. So, these are some of the testing activities that Janet and I are going to talk about today. Um, and so as we talk about testing activities, think about the ones you wrote down. Are, is there any correlation between what you do and what we talk about? Uh, or is there anything we talk about that you didn't think of as a testing activity that your team needs to do? And this, uh, this might make for some good questions or discussions at the end of our talk. So we've categorized these activities into four different categories um, that we're going to talk about today. And also think about which of these testing activities contribute to building quality in as opposed to testing the code that's been delivered to us to make sure our product has quality. So the subtle difference there sometimes. Were you done? Pardon? Were you done? I flipped the switch. Oh, sorry. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Parent presenting has its challenges. So the first category we had was asking questions, and there are lots of good ways to do this. We're not going to get into a lot about this because that could be a whole presentation on its own. But when you ask questions, remember to listen to the answers carefully. I am not a good listener. I have to always work on my listening skills. So ask clarifying questions. Repeat what the 
person said to you, make sure you understand it. And ask open-ended questions. Don't ask yes, no questions. Let people think and broaden out their ideas. Uh, so for example, instead of saying, oh, do we need to consider this persona as a user of the system, say, hey, who's gonna be using this system? Who's gonna use this feature? And so then you can clarify it as you go. So we're gonna talk more about being a QA uh, in this presentation. And QA, as we agree with Wayland that that should stand for question asker because we're really good at that. Okay. So we wanna give you an example of what we're talking about. And so let's pretend we're developing a conference proposal submission system. And our feature is that potential speaker can submit a talk to a conference for review. So here are some questions you might ask. And you can ask questions from different perspectives. Think of different personas, think of different stakeholders, what's valuable to different people. I like to bring something with me to planning meetings and brainstorm meetings uh, to help me think of questions like uh, Ellen got us in your seven product dimensions, or I'll take some cards out of the Pittsburgh card deck to prompt me to, to think more laterally, to think outside the box. Now, notice here that the last two questions are indeed yes, no questions. So think about how you can reword those questions to make them more open ended and help the stakeholders and the team think more broadly and make sure that you get into, uh, you, you don't want to have so many unknown unknowns at the end of your discussion. Okay. All right. Um, just uh, if you, Lisa's echo was getting really bad at the very end. So if you didn't understand something that she said, just let us know and, and I'll try to repeat it. Um, oh, I, Jane, you know, I could hear that. Yeah, no, I can actually hear it too. Do you think I should go out and do it again? Try. You can try while I'm doing this next section. You know, you'll have to read it, read it, let me, I think, if I do that. Okay. Okay. All right. Back in. Wish me luck. <laughs> yes. Thank you. I hope you can get back in. Um, all right. So the next uh, section, the next category or group of, of tests that we're going to talk about is using examples and tests to guide our development. Um, at, you may know it as, uh, we, I call it acceptance test driven development because that's a generic form, but you may know it as BDD, behavioral driven development or specification by example. Uh, really don't care what term you use. They have slightly different um, focuses, but the basic premise is the same, guiding development with examples. So we want to look at the importance of asking questions of the, this. So we start with our feature, we slice it into user stories, and this is where we start really thinking about our examples. We will um, we want to have a, a conversation, maybe your three amigos or, or maybe your whole team, talking about what are the high level acceptance tests and you want to explore examples and asking questions here to remove those hidden assumptions, right? Um, so we get that and then we have this, you know, bubble, the code test and automate story. And um, all the time we're thinking about how we fix defects. So those early, when we're asking questions, um, trying to get those assumptions up, those are preventing defects in code, right? Um, once you code automate, then your defects um, are in the code and you're fixing them that way, you're finding them there. Hopefully once that magic all happens, um, then we accept the story, the product owner accepts, and we take the next story in. Now this code test and automate, um, is sometimes a magic bubble that we don't pay enough attention to. I see teams uh, spending a lot of time exploring those examples and, and having those conversations and they get that right, but then they forget this bubble. So I wanna talk a little bit more about this, right? Um, because we now have our shared understanding, but um, a lot of the discussions don't translate back into how we actually code. They concentrate on building the right thing, but forget about building it right. Um, so I'm gonna delve a little bit deeper into that. So we're gonna start with our acceptance tests. Some of you may call it acceptance criteria. 
Um, but we start with that. We've had the conversation. We know our scope of our story. So as a tester, I would go back to my desk after an iteration planning meeting or after our conversation if we we're doing Kanban, and I'm going to go expand the tests because I know from experience that there's many more tests that we want to run besides those high level ones, right? I might be thinking uh, state diagrams. I might be thinking uh, boundary conditions, lots of other kinds of ideas. So I expand those tests and then I'm going to pair. I'm going to pair to discuss automation. Um, I'm pairing either with the programmer who's going to write the automation uh, method, the code, or maybe I'm pairing with an automator if that's what we have in our team, right? So in when we're pairing and having this discussion, um, maybe we talk about uh, what tests go at which level. Is it at the API level, the unit level, uh, or maybe the tests will be a full workflow through the UI. Have we thought about any of the quality attributes? Do we have to instrument the code? Do we uh, have to think about performance or load? How are we going to test security, right? But one of the biggest things is how or what should that test method look like for the API functional tests? So we can de develop that together. Now, um, my programmer or the test automator will go and create that test method. Right. Um, I, as a tester, I might go take those tests and put them into the automation framework. What is the actual test? Um, we do that. And now we're really thinking about how we're going to test, not how it's built, but what are we going to test? So the programmer takes that first test, probably the happy path, because if that doesn't work, nothing else matters. Right. So they're going to take that test. They're going to run it. It will fail because there's no code left, no code written yet. And then ideally they do their little TDD cycle, right? They write a unit test. It fails. They write the code to make it pass. And then they refactor and they do that again and again and again and again until that happy path test passes. Then they select another one another acceptance test, an example of, of what a misbehavior might be. <clears throat> and they repeat that till all those tests have passed. So at the end of that coding cycle, we now have automation at the unit level, we have automation at the API level, and we know that that particular story does what we thought it should do. And we have the automation, almost as a kind of a, a side effect, right? Uh, so we just do that till all the tests have passed. And now as a, as a tester or somebody performing those testing activities, uh, we're going to do our exploratory testing or any other testing required for the definition of story done, right? So we want to be thinking about what that means. It might be a desk check. Um, I call it a show me sitting with the programmer to say, hey, give me a demo of what you built. That's fast feedback, right? And we once we have that completed and all our defects are fixed, hopefully um, we accept the, sto the that story and we move on to the next one, right? So there's checks and loops within loops and checks within checks, um, but that's what helps us get good code, building it right. <clears throat> uh, so I want you to think about a little exercise here. I want you to, I'm going to have a little exercise. I want you to think testing first. So our story, a potential speaker withdraws a submitted talk. So I put one in, but now I want to take it back. I decided I didn't like that talk. Um, I want you to take a couple of minutes, um, jot down your ideas, put them in the chat. Um, Think about what questions you might ask to clarify that story. Would thinking of states might help of the, of the talk, right? Do you have examples? What tests? So take a minute um, or two, jot down your ideas, put them in the chat. Setting timer now.
I do hope people use the chat because then I that's the only way we know you're actually <laughs> there. Yeah, at least I think we're talking to nobody because there's nobody there. It says there are 169 people there. <laughs> <laughs> I know there are some good testers there. Ah, <laughs> there. Yes, that's a good one. This, yep. What examples would you ask for? Ah, a draft talk. Yeah. Uh, yes. How would we know when we're done with this story? Ah, you're thinking, okay, they need a little more time. Yeah, why would, why did the speaker withdraw? It'd be nice is to get that feedback. Is the, it's good to have that feedback. Is it important? to know why. Thirty seconds left. I might ask, oh yeah. Yeah. If you submit it online, how do you go how do you go about withdrawing? That's a really great question. It's like yeah, let's start because with the beginning. <laughs> we don't even know if the submission is an email system or mm -hmm. we're, we're kind of assuming that we're creating this um well this, and the timing uh, too douglas says too late but it, it is a timing thing it's like will we take different action depend on depending yes. on how close to the conference it is do we need to go get another speaker exactly like oh how yeah. do i know the status yeah yeah so there are different scenarios some of them you've you've um captured in your ideas, right? If it's a new submission and we haven't done anything already, um, maybe it, it doesn't matter. It's up to the speaker. They can withdraw it if they choose to. But if we've already reviewed it and rejected it, why would they with like, there's lots of different things. So think about um, using the, the different states. Is it accepted, rejected, pending, um, draft, right? So there's, lots of different things to think about. And you can put them into examples, right? So these examples will become tests. Because um, I can make them if it's, you know, in a current state, what's my request? What's the next state? So if we're trying to automate it, there might be different things. If it's already been accepted, do we have to have a special kinds of, of um, Maybe we can't automate that anymore because we've already put the program out. Maybe there's another one that says in the program, right? So there's different kinds of things to ask. And a lot of times we don't ask the right questions. We don't ask enough questions. Um, so we want to think about this before coding starts, right? We don't want to be finding these after the code is already written. So we'll, talk about the uh, different types of testing in a little bit more detail and I'll let Lisa take it away because her echo is gone. Is it gone? Okay. Yes. I, can't, I can't, I thought I was the only one hearing it because nobody said anything. I'm so sorry. So the Agile Testing Quadrants, if you've looked, read any of our books or seen our presentations, you might have run across these before. And Janet and I have used these as a thinking tool and a, a visual for guiding conversations for a really long time. And we've heard from many teams who also use it a lot of times they'll put a blank set of quadrants up on the wall or their virtual wall nowadays and start talking planning their testing what are all the testing things activities do we need do we have the people to do those do we have the resources do we have the test environments and the tools all kinds of things that you want to make sure that you're ready to do uh, and and think about when you're going to want to do them whether it's over the course of one iteration or a whole uh, release cycle to get a set of features out 
And a lot of times once they have those activities, they check them off as they're done. So it's a, just a nice way to guide conversations. Visualizing the types of testing your team needs to do makes it easier to talk about them. And then once we've had the conversation, we can talk about, you know, how do we know when they're completed? How do they contribute to story done, feature done, release done? The left-hand side of the quadrants, those tend to be all about completing things one story at a time at a more granular level. And the right side is more about getting a, multiple stories that make up a feature done, or maybe a whole set of features that we're gonna do a big release with. So that's those are ways that you can use the quadrants to help plan all the different testing activities that we've been talking about. And of course, we've only talked about a small set of them. Okay. Now, some of you may be familiar with a lot of uh, terminology. A lot of people use checking versus testing as terminology. And, you know, Janet walked us through doing an acceptance test driven development or behavior driven development or specification by example, whatever flavor that you might use. So you're getting examples to illustrate business rules. You're turning those examples into executable tests to guide your testing, get that shared understanding of what you need to build. And then once you've built them and automated those tests, they become automated regression tests in your continuous integration, providing that safety net to make sure that once we've released a feature, it keeps working the way that we expect it to work. So um, we're curious about in your teams, who does the checking in your team? Who, who helps to create these, these examples and tests and, and who automates them and who takes care of them once they're in the continuous integration? So just something, just something for you to think about. Yeah, thinking is good. Um, the, the last category we're gonna talk about is investigation testing. Um, and this is kind of uh, where testers get exciting. So there's a couple of different kinds, the exploratory testing, I, somebody mentioned it in the chat a little bit before. That's to help the find the surprises, the unknowns, what didn't we think about before, right? Um, and then testing quality attributes. That's the things like load performance. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about what we can do uh, to have those conversations early as well. So exploratory testing. I recommend everybody read Elizabeth Hendrickson's a book called Explore It, a fabulous book if you haven't already. Um, now, there's a, we're looking for the unknowns and there's lots of different ways to do exploratory testing. Um, one of the things that I like to tell people is always have that focus, that mission. I use exploratory test charters to help me with that. But a, a few of the different kinds of approaches might be um, looking at risks, whether it's implementation risks or business risks. Uh, we might wanna explore around that for every story, maybe for each feature. Um, workflows, user journeys, that's the most um, common that I see because it's the easiest way to think about it because that's how we're, we're thinking about the stories and, and the features as well. Personas is um, a really good a way to, to find different types of bugs. So if we're looking at that conference um, registration, say, perhaps somebody's entering their uh, submitting a talk, but maybe a persona we have is a somebody who doesn't have English as a first language, right? Um, maybe we can, we need to find our way around, but it's not so easy because we're not understanding. Or perhaps it's a persona might be somebody who's coming in and registered last year. Can we use their information from last year? So different personas can help us look at our application a different way. And the last one I'm going to talk about, it's not the only one, by the way, is tours. Um, I like to do tours during the end game as a final kind of uh, look because we're looking at the application from a different perspective. It can be combined with the user journeys, for example. Um, I recommend that you um, Google exploratory testing and tours, and you'll get lots of examples of different types. But it's a good way to look at the system as a whole, though some people use it for lots of other different things as well. Um, when we're looking at quality attributes, um, 
the first thing is don't put that as a separate story, please. Uh, think of it as constraints on every story you build. So on the right side, the development um, environment, these are quality attributes. These are about building it right, right? Can, is our code modifiable? Is it reusable? Is it testable, right? But then we have the deployment and environment um, and we're thinking about how do we do it, like recoverability or can we put it to different um, devices? Is it portable? These sorts of things we need to talk about before we start coding because that's part of, we need to build that in, right? So we wanna ask those questions early. We can't actually test it till the code exists. Even the, the operational kinds of ones, security, reliability. At the beginning, when you're talking about a feature or a story, ask, what do we need to think about for security? Um, so constraints with every single story and, and have that conversation about who's responsible, how are we gonna think about this? One um, aspect that um, I learned from Margaret Denise, Denise, is that her name? Yes, um, is the idea of uh, these scales, the sliding scales. I thought this was quite brilliant. Um, as a team, as an organization, you can do it on many different levels, right? So have a list of all the quality attributes that you think is important. And then ask everybody, where is their risk level or what do they think is the most important and slide that scale. You will find out what different people think are important. This is part of the, uh, if you ask the question, what's the worst thing that can happen, right? There's security, everybody, so our data gets stolen, right? That's a very important attribute. So it'll be slid right over to the 10. Have, get alignment on this because it's so important. Um, don't leave it till it's too late. Um, and so we're just gonna kind of finish up this uh, talk and Lisa, take it on. Alrighty. I got so involved in what you were saying. <laughs> I didn't advance my own slides. Okay. So <clears throat> if you haven't already done it earlier, I talked about getting your whole team together, the whole delivery team, all the different people in different specialties and talk about quality. What level of quality do your customers need and what can you commit to delivering? So again, in my experience, the teams where we did this at the beginning, we were more successful in achieving our goals and achieving a high level of performance because we knew we'd run into problems and it helped us have the commitment to collaborate to work around those problems, get where we wanted to go. So one of the things that we think are really important are these core practices that nowadays we have all these surveys and studies that, that have science to back up the effectiveness of these different practices and how they help your team become high performing, how they help your business be successful. So continuous integration, for example, it's a core agile practice. If you don't have continuous integration now and some teams still do not have it, I would stop everything else you're doing and get that going. It's not hard to get it going. The harder part is getting automated regression tests and other automated suites and things to, to flesh it out. But we, <clears throat> these days we're constantly changing and building new code and we need to get it merged into our master trunk and run things like static code analysis, automated unit tests. So that within a few minutes of making a new commitment to the code base, we have the feedback, make sure we didn't break anything. And having potentially shippable pro a product at the end of every iteration or more often, that's really, really key. And it can take a while to get there when you start out. It's not going to happen right away, but stick to it and you'll get there. Um, the business stakeholders, product owners, et cetera, they're going to help the team by prioritizing what's the most important thing to build next. What's the most valuable thing that we can deliver to our customers next? And let's slice that into increments so we can deliver frequently and get feedback and keep building on what we've got and minimize risk. And then they also are the ones who decide to accept the stories that we deliver, the features that we deliver. And they keep learning as we get feedback from production. We have all this great, all these great tools to get production 
data, how people are using it in production. Uh, so the business stakeholders are part of the process. Really important to everybody to collaborate together. Now we talk about continuous delivery and delivering frequently. Uh, continuous delivery doesn't mean you have to deploy to production every time you have a successful build. It means you get to choose. And there are some business domains where the customers do not want frequent releases. So things like medical devices need regulatory approval or the different domains maybe only want it once a quarter or even once a year. But the important thing is that your team's goal should be to have a shippable release candidate at any time, every day. If you had to release, you could. And that's how you keep your technical debt to a minimum. That's how you keep your ability to deliver new functionality and new, new quality attributes in small chunks. So it's based on the need of the business. <clears throat> so at every level, the people have a different role to play. We have to start with the organization level because again, we have lots of studies like the ones done by Amy Edmondson at Google that psychological safety is a prerequisite to everything else. We have to feel safe to innovate, to experiment, to fail, because that's all about learning. We have to feel safe to ask questions and to, you know, to really push back if we think something is not going the right direction. Uh, get the click guards uh, webinar, uh, was it last month, I think, that she did on psychological safety and, and self-care uh, is really good to help with that. Um, and then we use these core practices that we just talked about to help us build quality in at every level with every part of the company and team helping. So keep having these conversations among your team. Keep talking about it. Keep improving a little bit at a time. All right. Uh, how can we be confident to make be doing things like continuous delivery, releasing small changes frequently without stressing ourselves out. It sounds scary and it's a, it's a big it's a big topic and it's a challenge. But we need to use the good practices that Janet talked about, eliciting business roles and examples from our customers and our business stakeholders, turning them into executable tests, making the time for investigative testing, building your safety net of continuous integration, automated tests, automate all the toil to free our human brains and for the really complex problems and keep caring for our product and our customers when our when we release to production. Keep those feedback loops all going. Now, some sometimes we don't know a lot. Some people have not had the experience of being able to work on a team that's already, that's, that's finally gotten. They took them years, but they got to this point in time and they have, good quality agile processes and they get to experience the magic of that. So if you don't have the experience to compare that to, you might not, you might not know, but we're curious if any of you have felt that, that unicorn magic of working on a team that's really clicking and collaborating and making progress together. So if you have, please, and you feel like sharing that yeah. in the chat, we'd love to hear about it. I have several times yeah. been very lucky that been way. Lucky, yeah. Okay. So that's all the the information that we want to present to you today about quality processes, but here's more information. And I think our Twitter handles were covered up by our pictures on the crowdcast, depending on the size oh, of your browser, okay. probably. But yeah. at least person at Janet Gregory CA. Yeah, so email us, tweet, whatever you want to do, we'll be happy to respond. Um, and these are some of the things we talked about, um, the books, different things. So they'll be all available as well. And I think this is where I'll stop sharing and we can have, we have time for questions. Hello. Hello. Well, first, um, thank you so much, Janet and Lisa. I'll give you this um, virtual flower. Ah, oh, thank <laughs> yeah. you. It's very uh, pretty. Thanks, um, so much for making this happen, right? Um, for doing this presentation. Um, yes, and now it's time for questions, people. There is the ask a question box in the middle of the screen down there. Um, so if you do not find a question that relates to what you want to find out, um, please post one by yourself or just upvote for the one that's already in there. And um, for everyone who's attended this talk, um, please take your time and think about a question. Until then, I would definitely 
just jump into the question box because there are already some in there. So I'm, I'm just going to start from the top. And so let's have a look. Um, okay, there's been a couple of votes for this question by Rick. How do you recommend testing systems uh, where dependent upon work products are made in separate sprints? System testing is not possible because the system is not ready. But testing only the product of a sprint leads to silo, silo mentality meaning. Lots of green ticks, but quality aspects like scalability, security, are tested later and by separate teams. Yeah, so um, there's, a, there's a couple of things. On the slide that Lisa talked about towards the very end, and I said product, uh, product management um, is supposed to provide clear priorities to work effectively. Um, part of that is how can we make sure everybody's working on something to make it end to end so that we can actually do all of that testing. If different teams, and i reading a little bit into that question maybe, um, if different teams are building on, um, are building on one system, then you have to end up waiting. But trying to figure out how we can get a end-to-end -end thin slice so that we can build in the scalability, so that we can build in the, um, the different attributes, right? So sometimes we think we have to have all of the front end and then all of the back end and then all of the business logic and all of this separate. But taking that thin slice and how we slice those features is critical and that's part of that product management and and the team working together um, to try to to help that and so it becomes a, an important thing hopefully i answered the right question because <laughs> well, yeah i'll just add to that because i'm i'm working with a for a company that where our product is almost 20 years old and a lot of the product is still in one big monolith and yes. that makes it a lot more challenging <laughs> because we've got dozens of teams and each are working on different assets but they all are connected and can't be released separately and so it takes a lot of coordination and what you know definitely we want to break up the monolith i don't think you necessarily have to do that but we're trying to help the teams take ownership and be autonomous in their testing being thinking about quality all the time so that their part is is solid and of course it does mean that you know, this is something we release once a quarter and we have other parts of the product we can release more often. And so it does require some stabilization, some, you know, we just had a bug bash on Friday where a whole bunch of people got in a Zoom and got in breakout rooms and we had a very organized way to test different parts of the product. Those are sort of stopgap measures as you try to find better solutions to to and again yeah. trying to get that communication so we don't feel like silos and we don't get frustrated by bottlenecks yeah it takes a long time to build that in it does mm -hmm. all right and especially with the remote times we have right so the the tip of having those calls and having breakout rooms to go through that one by one is really it's just essential, right? It works. It works really well, though. So yeah. we're happy. That's great. All right. Um. So the next question. Here we go. Mm -hmm. Ariel has asked a question. Is it possible to attain a quality process cert certificate? Here we go. Such as ISO 9001-2015 for testing and Q&A in an agile environment. Auditors. Oh, no. Where is it go? Um, here. Um, auditors will request a documented process and evidence for a lot of deliverables, interaction and risk management, all of which could probably undermine the very essence of agile testing. So, I get, that, I get asked that question a lot. I'm, I'm, Lisa does too, I'm sure. Um, one of the things to think about is um, what is the audit trying to do? If you go back to its very essence of the audit, most of the time it says, show evidence that. It doesn't say, give me a, a process document. That's been the way we've solved it in the past and it's easy to keep doing that. Um, so sometimes you have to dig deeper to find that. I've worked with um, medical device um, teams and they've 
been able to uh, document their process through their automation, right? So that they haven't had to create paper documents. Their process is their documentation and they can, um, they've automated the way they look at it. Um, and so they haven't had to do those sorts of things. And that's past FDA approval. I know Lisa's worked with financial um, mm -hmm. and done the same kind of things, right? Yeah, I find the auditors are, you know, they're humans and they're actually pretty easy to talk to and they're open minded. Well, the ones we worked with were like, wow, you I can look at your test results and that documents what you're doing. That's that's just what I need. Traceability back to the story. Yeah. So it's, it's doable. Yeah. So go back and ask that first question. What is it we're really trying to do? I <laughs> see that Rakesh's question has the most votes. Can we have that one next? Um, uh, oh, yes, the very first one right now, upvoted, right. How, Q, how QA or how can QA bring business value other than identifying risk, preventing or finding defects? By of, course, of course, those are very valuable things right there. But I, because I've worked on cross-functional teams where everyone is seen as having equal voice. So that the QAs aren't second class citizens, everybody can participate. And I have witnessed more than once where we were trying to figure out a very difficult algorithm and we and then the developers could not figure out how would they approach that in the code. They could not figure out how to code it. And a tester got up on the whiteboard or the virtual whiteboard and said, what if we did it this way? Now they're not a coder necessarily, or maybe they have some coding experience, but they just have a brainstorm of a, a good way to solve that problem. So I think again, that having those diverse perspectives and we see things from a different viewpoint and we might even be able to come up with solutions to problems sometime. And also by having that customer perspective, that big picture view of things, I think that, that helps us add value. What do you think, Janet? Yeah, I, I believe so too. Um, I'm just the last thing you said, that big picture. One of the things that um, I think testers do extremely well is being able to understand the impacts in other parts of the system, right? So if we do this, that's going to affect those reports to accounting or other things as well. So it comes back to, um, so, so, so one of the things that I, I talk about sometimes is I say, instead of thinking our job is to do this, this, and this, how can we help the team deliver the product successfully? And that can be many different things, right? Um, so just be open and ask yourself, can I add value here? Is, will I help if I ask that question? Mm -hmm. I think asking questions is a big way we add value because I'm yeah, always hearing, oh, that's a good question. We're question askers. Yeah, okay. indeed. <laughs> All right. I just asked Rakesh in the chat if uh, yeah. he has um, anything else to say to see what he says. Um, just moving on to the next one, actually referring to Deming's quality, um, um, uh, a list of quality features you mentioned early on. Yeah. So um, that's a nice one. The 13th point of um, W. Edward Deming's quality philosophy is implement education and self-improvement. In this COVID-19 challenging time, what areas and skills testing professionals need to focus and learn to prepare them for the future? What key areas and basic skills do you suggest testers and test leads need to work in the umbrella of self-improvement? A question by Tahir. Yeah, self-improvement. So one of the things that I do kind of every morning is I go through, um, I go through Twitter. I'm not an avid Twitter person like Lisa is, but I'll go through and I'll look and I'll look at blog posts. I have a couple of things that I watch, different things. Um, and I'll pull up three or four articles, podcasts, webinars, something along that line, something that's interesting to me and, and where I need to be. So I, I put aside a certain amount of time every day just to learn, to be keeping up to date, to be seeing what people say. I think if you're on a, a team so last month, I spent all my time learning how to work remotely, how to translate our course from giving it on in person to giving it remotely. How could we do the exercises? So that was my immediate need. That's what I learned. If you're on a team, and I'll turn it over to Lisa for this, because she's been doing that lately, um, learning something very specific, right? 
yeah, I, there's so many, it's, it's, it's like too much to learn and it's all exciting. So one of the things I've been learning is, is about more that right side of that DevOps loop of how do, you know, how do we test in production? How do we use that production data to help us focus our testing better? And especially using observability, how do we instrument our systems and get data, log, save data about the events in our system so that if something unexpected happens, we can go ask questions of that data without having to go, as I'm sure some of you have done before, it's like, oh, we don't have any information in the logs about that error. Let's go add some logging add some instrumentation and then we'll have to redeploy and hope that that problem happens again so we can see so we want to be able to, to anticipate that have the data we need in advance we don't know what's going to happen and we need to be able to answer those questions which i think is a form of exploratory testing and um and so that's really where i'm focused and i really encourage testers don't be frightened off by the word devops it sounds like it doesn't include testers but you know what we're part of both dev and ops so it does include us get involved they need us it's a great place to ask questions. You know, are we are we recording the events that we need to record to be able to ask these questions? Are we logging the right data? Are we visualizing the right data in our dashboards and our monitoring? So there's a lot of things we can do there. And you know, how can we use release feature toggles and and do progressive rollouts and things like that? I I don't want to get into that too much, but I think that right side of the DevOps loops is a, is an exciting place to be, as well as the left side of getting involved early with testing features when they're still at the idea stage. Yeah. So pay attention to what you is on your radar and go learn about it. And don't be scared, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, I think we'll have time for one more question if this is okay for you. It's already five, but um, uh, Claire um, has actually, oh, Lisa already. Well, I, I wrote an answer in case we didn't have time to answer. But... Okay, all right. But can I still um, do that one, the last one? All right. So um, Claire Davis is asking, how can I help a product team so bogged down and so poor tickets they're struggling to build new features? I'll let Janet answer because I wrote it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, sometimes I, I think the right thing to do is stop. Hmm. Really just stop hmm. um, and, and ask yourself, is this making sense? Because um, you can get down that, and it's a spiral. Been on teams like that. It's a spiral. You cannot get out. So instead of even thinking about new features, just stop and think about why is our quality so bad we have all these support tickets? And, and start addressing that. Think about a Pareto chart and say, what is the most important thing? right? And tackle that. Put new features on hold get a good base so that you can start or you'll just keep adding technical debt. Um, but just stop. Take a deep breath. <laughs> figure out where you are. That That is an extreme measure, but I've known teams that had to do it. And I mean, yeah. I've been on teams that had to do it. But but yeah. depending on how bad it is, so, you know, I, I put it in my written answer that we, we kind of just had a budget. It's like, hey, we're going to spend three story points every sprint. We're going to start with the high bugs. What was interesting is we got through the high bugs over a few months. And then when we started on the normal bugs and, and at the sprint review, we said, okay, well, we fixed these normal bugs and the business stakeholders all said, wait, no, we don't care about those bugs. Do new features, just leave those bugs alone. So a lot of times you need to be working with your business people to make sure they want you to spend time on that. Yeah. And also we realized like, even when we didn't have a big backlog of bugs, three, uh, one quarter to one third of our development time was spent triaging or working on production problems, having to manually fix things in the database, which is really frightening on a financial services application. So we budgeted time for all of us to spend embedded on, with the customer, with the business people in their operations teams and uh, accountants, finance, all the different departments. And by increasing our domain knowledge, we were able to more be more likely to deliver the right thing that they wanted. So and automate those processes. So yeah, so there's a comment just saying if they don't want to put the new features on hold because it brings in revenue or, or client contracted, what is the cost of not fixing your quality? That's yeah, make sure that you just explain yeah. it to the business and they can, they can make the decision. Yep, and, and they have to know the risk. 
So as a tester, this is one of the things that I think uh, you can do is explain the risk. If you can articulate the risk of not fixing those bugs, that might help a lot. And sometimes you just have to walk away and say, we do what we can do. All right. Oh. Thanks, everybody. This is great. Um, that was a nice, a nice last sentence. <laughs> um, yes, um, thanks again, first of all, um, to you two for you know, making time um, for us to do this webinar. Um, if there is anything unanswered, I think there are two questions there, and also I will have a look through the, through the chat and just send it to you um, um, both, Lisa and Janet, so you can answer them um, when you have some time, and then we will put it in a blog post. So watch out, everyone, for the blog post. It's going to come within the next days. Um, also, the replay will be available, so check that out. Um, also, check out the Agile Testing Fellowship um, if you want to learn more. Um, from these two ladies here, please um, just book a book a course or come to the next conference. Um, could be as our testing day. I don't know. I heard it's really good. And um, yeah, thanks of course to to everyone who attended and for those who you know also made their time to attend and to put up some questions. Um, we wouldn't be here without um, the whole community and without the attendees and without speakers. So thanks again for everyone. Um, and I hope that everyone's going to be okay in these crazy times. Right. Yes. So that, that would be my last word. Uh, be safe, everyone. And then um, we'll see you on July 15th for the next webinar. And we have to say some of you, even if we're remote, uh, to Agile Testing Days. So absolutely. Yeah, that would be great. It's a great that community, great. even remotely. <laughs> thanks Lisa, thanks Janet and Our um, pleasure. have a nice rest of the day and um, we'll hopefully see each other soon thanks bye -bye. Bye. Bye. thank you broadcast is ending right now <laughs> bye